Okay, so first we're gonna have Mark Rodenberg's keynote on the Constitution and privacy, why the Supreme Court cares, and then Ted Ruger is going to be a discussant. Then we are going to give you um, a 15 minute break to get to the afternoon breakout sessions. And I wanna, I wanna plug the four different sessions for those of you that didn't sign up for one yet. Again, the first one, 1A, is does the US need EU data protections? And that's moderated by Frank Pasquale. The second one is what is the value of health data to organized crime? That's gonna be moderated by Jordan Robertson, the Bloomberg Business Week reporter that was uh, just in front of you with LaTanya. The third one is going to be cultural perspectives on religion and privacy. This one is going to be very dynamic, moderated by Pablo Molina. And the last one is patient data in the cloud, how is it used and protected? Uh, and that's gonna be moderated by Deborah Diener. Then we're going to have, um, after those sessions, we're gonna have another plenary on big data, moderated by Deborah Hurley, and then at 4.40, we have Todd Park, and then a little break, and then fun, celebration for privacy. So uh, let me introduce to you first, Mark Rotenberg. How many people already know who he is? <laughs> okay, it's probably most of the audience. Okay, so I'm not gonna say too much, except those of you who don't know him, um, he is one of the most uh, original, creative, and brilliant uh, legal experts in the nation, and he's on your side. He is the defender of the public's interests in privacy across uh, so many realms. I can't even remember them, Mark, but you know, one of, one of the more recent famous ones was, uh, he was responsible for those little pictures everywhere, you know, the X, you know, the body scanners, and he's the reason that they're taking them out. So uh, he is the uh, president, yeah, <laughs> of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, he's a very dear friend. I'm delighted to be on his board, and so I felt like we had to have someone talk to us about the Constitution because, you know, over in healthcare, we don't hear too much about it, so. Yep, so thank you for right. coming and talking. And Ted, thank you for joining us too. Ted is from UPenn Law School and he is uh, going to be the discussant and then we'll open things up to questions. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Deb, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Regarding this uh, speech topic, I would like to say in my defense, I selected it with the best of intentions. <laughs> I really had no idea that I would have to start carrying around a box of Q-tips in my car beginning uh, this week after a decision of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Apparently five justices have concluded that there's no difference between taking a photograph or a fingerprint or collecting a DNA sample. It's just all one and the same. Uh, so what I'm going to do during this talk is briefly outline where I think the court is on the key issue of privacy and then put out a few of my own uh, high priority items uh, in brief terms what I would consider to be an agenda for privacy in the United States in 2013. And the way I plan to tie these two topics uh, together is by saying to you that if the Supreme Court uh, doesn't do it, we should do it. Uh, but let's spend a few minutes talking about what it is that the court has done uh, so far, because we're clearly at a very interesting moment in the development of the right to privacy in the United States. Uh, it was just a few years ago, in fact, that the court considered the constitutionality of the Vermont uh, prescription uh, privacy uh, statute, uh, which as many of you know, the court determined uh, violated uh, the First Amendment as an impermissible restriction on speech. Uh, Epic wrote a brief in that case looking at a narrow issue, but I think an issue that would be of interest uh, to you, uh, which is that we were concerned, in fact, about the patient's privacy interest, which wasn't directly presented to the court. The court was looking at uh, prescriber identified records and assumed, as did the Vermont legislature, that the patient records had been adequately de-identified. 
and we have on our advisory board many uh, distinguished experts, including the uh, cryptographer who created the MD5 hash algorithm, Ron Rivest. And that was the technique that had been used by one of the companies to safeguard uh, the prescriber records in that case. And I went uh, to Ron and I said, um, you know, is MD5 still good? And he said, no, actually it's not. And I went to someone else on our advisory board, Bruce Schneier, who had busted MD5. And I said, Bruce, you know, Ron agrees that there's a problem with MD5. And he says, yeah, I busted it. And uh, so we wrote a brief to the court in that case actually trying to raise the issue of, of uh, the adequacy of de-identification in the prescription privacy context. The court didn't get to that issue, um, but I think at some point it will. Another interesting case a couple of years ago that may be of interest to you was uh, NASA versus Nelson. Uh, those were the very, um, you know, intrusive background investigations that were taken from employees at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who argued that there really should be some constitutional limitations on the scope of collection of, of personal information by the federal government. Uh, the court considered that claim. They didn't exactly reject uh, the informational privacy concept, although I remember Justice Scalia wrote famously that informational privacy was like a stalking apparition from a Hitchcock movie. So maybe he rejected the claim. Um, but the court concluded that the Privacy Act provided sufficient protection for records collected by federal agencies and therefore was not necessary to reach uh, the constitutional question. Uh, interestingly, uh, within a week of the court's announcement of that opinion, as we had warned, NASA had another uh, security breach, information that had been collected that was supposed to be safeguarded under the Privacy Act uh, became available uh, to others. So we, we think there may be something there to look at again as well. But my optimism about the court and privacy in this particular topic was fueled in part by a decision last term uh, concerning the tracking of cars through GPS identification, uh, which many of you may know as U.S. versus Jones. And the remarkable fact about this particular case um, is not only that the court unanimously decided that there was a Fourth Amendment violation, it's that they weren't arguing over whether there was a right to privacy. They were arguing over the basis of the right. Could the right be found in traditional notions of trespass law, which was the view of uh, Justice uh, Scalia in that case, or would the right be found in the more modern notion of a reasonable expectation of privacy, which was the view that somewhat grudgingly, but, but nonetheless uh, the view expressed by Justice Alito in that case. And so we looked at Jones and we said there seems to be consensus as to the outcome just a disagreement as to how we get there. This term is a bit more complicated. Uh, this term began with a somewhat disappointing five to four decision regarding the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, but really about the key question of standing, which as many of you know in the privacy realm is the threshold for whether you can bring uh, a privacy claim, whether you can show harm in fact. And the court in that case uh, was actually not willing to allow the petitioners to go forward with their allegations that the government had violated the Fourth Amendment through certain uh, powers created by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act uh, because they simply couldn't establish uh, that the harm had occurred. The, the court even speculated that the party was trying to generate the harm to provide the basis to go forward. So that seemed like a setback. And then we got this wonderful case involving uh, dog sniffs. It was a kind of a split year for the dogs. You know, one of them prevailed on its reliability. I think that was Aldo. And then another dog just couldn't do it. The sniff was not up to snuff, uh, to paraphrase Justice Kagan's uh, words. Um, in the instance where uh, the police officer approached the home essentially for the purpose of trying to detect whether or not uh, there were drugs present without uh, a warrant. And here, once again, spirits lifting, although it was a five to four opinion, uh, Justice Kagan wrote this concurrence which seemed to bridge 
our notions of trespass and our notions of reasonable expectation of privacy and said that we would reach the same result in this case following both paths. And that was a view that was joined by Justice Sotomayor and Justice uh, Ginsburg in the Jardine's opinion. So it seemed as if there was almost a unified approach to privacy protection emerging in the court this term. And we were all uh, very excited. And then, of course, we got the decision this, work, this week in Maryland versus King, uh, a case that we had devoted a lot of um, attention to, uh, which was a five to four opinion going the other way. Here we have uh, a dissent now by Scalia, joined by Kagan, by Ginsburg, and Sotomayor. But the fifth vote in Jardines, which was Thomas, that went over to the new majority. And that was the opinion by Justice Kennedy, saying that there was really nothing more going on here than the identification of the suspect through the DNA collection, much as a fingerprint or photograph uh, might provide identification. Uh, there's one more case to be decided this term that we're interested in. It's uh, concerning records in uh, state DMVs under the Driver's Privacy Protection Act. We'll see what the outcome is there. But I guess, um, you know, what I would say to you at this uh, point as we think about the future of the right to privacy is that the Supreme Court uh, doesn't necessarily have the last word. Uh, the court can interpret a statute. The court can look at a provision in the U.S. Constitution and, and say what it believes the case law requires. Uh, but Congress can come back later and say, well, we disagree. We want a different result, uh, a different outcome. Or organizations, uh, through political action, can say there are other ways to obtain uh, political ends. Uh, that don't require the courts or the Congress. Uh, both of those strategies were on my mind this past week because, in fact, uh, Epic had worked for many years to have the backscatter X-ray devices removed from U.S. airports. And last week, uh, the TSA announced that it had completed the removal of those devices from the airports. That, that took a lot of uh, work, but, but it was possible. Um, and I know also with the Health Privacy Project, there's very important work being done to safeguard medical privacy. And even on the legislative side, big debate in the last week concerning the privacy of reporter records. Well, that's an issue where the court, you know, 40 years ago said there was really nothing special about police going into newsrooms to get the records of reporters. Congress disagreed. Congress passed a law and said there really is something different and those records are entitled to greater protection. So in the spirit of proposing that um, these decisions are not always going to be uh, determined uh, by the court, I wanted to uh, share with you what I think would be five reasonable objectives uh, today uh, to protect uh, privacy going forward. And in setting these out, I think you will also appreciate that while none of the proposals specifically addresses medical privacy, the five taken together would have an enormous uh, beneficial impact uh, to help safeguard medical records in the United States. Uh, my first recommendation concerns a proposal that the President made over a year ago when he set out the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. This is an important framework for privacy protection that follows the well-known fair information practices which is to allocate the rights and responsibilities in the collection and use of personal data. It is a more robust approach to privacy protection than what is often described as the notice and choice uh, regime. Uh, two recent studies, by the way, or at least a study and an interesting comment in a book, one by Alessandro Acquisti, uh, looking at Facebook users over a five-year period and noting that even though they continue to engage in privacy protecting choices and behavior, Facebook continues to alter the privacy preferences and the choice environment such that their personal information becomes more widely available than they might otherwise intend. I think this is a good empirical study in support of the proposition that notice and choice is not an adequate regime for privacy. And Cass Sunstein, in his recent book on uh, reforming the federal government, 
used a very interesting phrase in talking about Google and privacy. He said that Google and other companies like Google are, in essence, choice architects. They create the environment in which people make decisions about how they collect and use personal information. And so both of those points are in support of the view that I think we need to take the President's Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights and see that enacted into law. Second recommendation I would make on one of the hot privacy topics today in Washington, D.C., is to update the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. Now, I will say that is a law that is uh, near and dear to my heart. I worked on that law. I helped bring together uh, legal experts and, and, and technical experts in the early 1980s to talk about updating the Federal uh, Wiretap Act. And I think at the time we had an important insight, which is that as you move from the analog world to the digital world, suddenly information is created and stored in ways that was not previously possible in the wired telephone network. And so you think about the storage of that information in its various stages as to how to protect it. The model we had at the time was you know, something like the post office, that we had companies engaging in electronic communication services that were operating somewhere between telephone companies and, and postal companies, and they were storing these messages uh, uh, for their users. Well, you fast forward 25 years, and today it's clear that as we move toward the cloud-based model, all of our data is stored in these post offices. And the default has to be toward much greater protection of the information that it, about us that concerns us that is remotely stored and under the control of others. So the ECPA updates, I think, are critically important. A third point, uh, which I think also represents the broad scope of agreement in the privacy world, is the need to overturn the third party doctrine. And this is the rule that says that the Fourth Amendment interest of the subject uh, basically vanishes once those records are no longer, you know, in the home, the office, the personal possession of, of the person who's being uh, searched. Um, that is a rule that came from the court as a consequence of two decisions in the 1970s. I think it's remarkable to note that uh, Justice Sotomayor, in her concurrence in uh, U.S. versus Jones, talked about the need to change the third party doctrine. And just two weeks ago, Senator Rand Paul, who Epic recently uh, honored, uh, introduced legislation uh, in the U.S. Congress to overturn the third party doctrine. I don't know if this is something that is uh, likely to happen or would easily be accomplished, but I think it's encouraging to see what could fairly be described as a broad uh, swath of you know, the political view in the United States in support of that um, effort. My fourth recommendation for U.S. Uh, privacy agenda uh, addresses the growing uh, friction between the United States and the European Union regarding the future of international privacy frameworks and even the EU's own efforts uh, to update and modernize its privacy law. It is not a good day uh, when the United States stands opposed to the efforts of other countries to modernize its privacy uh, framework. Uh, and yet that day seems to be reoccurring uh, every time someone from the State Department or the Commerce Department or the Justice Department or the USTR uh, takes a swing at the legislation that's been put forward uh, by the European Commission and the European Parliament to provide greater privacy rights to European citizens. Uh, we have urged for many years that the United States uh, ratify, adopt and ratify the Council of Europe Privacy Convention 108. Uh, it is a very important international framework for privacy protection. It mirrors many of the safeguards uh, that currently exist in the U.S. where we have privacy law. It's quite compatible with the European Union uh, directive as well as the general data protection regulation. 
And for those who might say, well, the United States shouldn't necessarily get behind a Council of Europe uh, convention, I'd like to point out it was just a few, few years ago that the U.S. helped draft and urged support for the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime. So if we can use the Council of Europe to put forward an international framework combating cybercrime, which I think is a, a reasonable goal, I think we can also support the Council of Europe in the effort to create an international framework for privacy protection. Certainly that would be much more uh, constructive uh, than simply uh, raising criticisms and objections to the current European efforts. Um, my final uh, suggestion today uh, concerns a topic of interest to me from, for many, many years. Uh, it was over uh, 25 years ago that I testified in the U.S. Congress on the need to establish an independent privacy agency um, in the United States. And I had at that time done a survey and written an article, and I was very impressed uh, by these agencies. Uh, they had significant expertise in the privacy realm. They had a legal authority. They tended to promote uh, transparency. They offered an institutional bulwark uh, against many of the forces that seem to be eroding the right to privacy in addition uh, to whatever other laws had been established in the various countries where these agencies were uh, created. And I outlined how this could be done in the U.S. and there was a bill introduced in the Senate and I think we got about 30 votes. Um, and it never happened. Um, and over the years, there have been many different uh, efforts to create privacy-like agencies in the U.S. We have of course, chief privacy officers and many federal agencies. Uh, the FTC, I think, has done uh, significant work on behalf of uh, consumers uh, filling into that role, at least with regard to consumer protection. And most recently, we have the President's uh, Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, which just today announced uh, it, its charter. I still think the U.S. needs an independent privacy commission. I still think we need an agency with the authority and the expertise to represent the interests of Americans against the growing challenges to personal privacy that result from the accelerating uh, collection automation of personal uh, data. Uh, one of the remarkable things that I've observed over the last few years as countries have come under increasing uh, pressure, political pressure, and economic pressure in Europe, independent organizations are looking to the strength of data protection agencies in addition to the freedom of the courts and the freedom of the press as one of the key measures of the health of a democracy. Uh, I think about this, for example, in Hungary where there are continued concerns about the strength of the democratic uh, government. Uh, I think, to conclude, one of the ways that we measure the health of a democracy is by our willingness uh, to protect the privacy of our citizens and our consumers. And if the U.S. court is not at this moment up for the task, I hope that all of you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, uh, for those very um, perceptive and provocative remarks, uh, which I largely agree with. So I'll, I'll um, need to think of something to extend or, or say that's uh, somewhat interesting. Um, uh, I come here as a teacher and scholar of health law and constitutional law, uh, fairly broadly, as opposed to a privacy expert. Um, and um, Mark's, Mark, your, your, your remarks fit with one of the major themes of, of American constitutionalism and constitutional scholarship that I've noticed since I entered teaching just over a decade ago, and, and in sharp contradistinction to what I remember in law school when, you know, constitutional law, capital C, capital L, was all about this, this uh, building a few blocks behind me uh, up on First Street, the Supreme Court. But essentially, the Constitution was, you know, a very slim piece of paper plus whatever the justices did and that was about that for what we learned about the Constitution. Um, the big change in our thinking about the Constitution is embodied nicely in, in Mark's talk that um, certainly over the past decade, um, 
or more, we, we tend to think and see constitutionalism all around us and in institutions where people don't wear robes uh, and in other venues here in Washington, other branches of government, but certainly then um, 50 different state capitals and popular movements and, and things like that. And we see, uh, we see this in action, um, you know, these, in this um, current kind of season of constitutional debate on issues like um, same-sex marriage, which is clearly a constitutional movement transforming the lives of people in many states, where to date at least, may change in a few weeks, uh, the Supreme Court has been silent. But the point is, even if the Supreme Court is relatively passive in its rulings on same-sex marriage in the next few weeks, um, the ferment and constitutional change and real kind of change in the shape of our constitutional order will continue through these other institutions. Um, I was just reminded also during Mark's talk of um, it's always a pleasure to come, back, come to Georgetown, come back to Georgetown. I used to work in D.C. I was in, I think, this auditorium 10 or 12 years ago, or 12 years ago, I guess, at a conference uh, in the wake of the Supreme Court's very controversial decision in FDA versus Brown and Williamson, when the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 vote, disabled the FDA's uh, ability to uh, regulate tobacco. Um, you may know that three, just three, apropos of Mark's point, took a decade, but uh, working through Congress uh, by statutory change, uh, the, the, that decision was overruled, and the FD, FDA now is in the, trying to get into the business of regulating tobacco better. Um, but in that intervening decade, it's interesting what happened and very, very much supports Mark's kind of multimodal strategy. Um, the FDA, when it promulgated its tobacco regulations that were struck down, but when it promulgated them in 1997, it had an ambitious goal of cutting youth smoking by 50 percent over the following decade. So those, and, and it needed this authority to do it. So what happens? It gets up to the Supreme Court and the FDA is disabled from regulating smoking. What happened in the next decade? Lo and behold, youth smoking rates dropped by almost as much as the FDA's aspirational goal, even though the FDA was on the sidelines because of the Supreme Court's ruling. And how did that happen? It's exactly along the lines of what Mark was talking about. Uh, advocates, public health authorities, um, other groups uh, just shifted the institutional strategy to institutions that were more amenable to the change in ways that produced salutary results. And so I think this roadmap on the, in the privacy context um, is one that we've seen in other policy areas where one institutional pathway, perhaps the most natural one, appears to be blocked. Um, those who care about the issue need to, to seek other institutional solutions, and sometimes that multimodal strategy works quite well. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm very supportive of, of all of Mark's proposals. Um, in a more pessimistic note, I'm equally uh, support and endorse, and I'm going to amplify in a couple minutes, uh, uh, taking a couple minutes, Mark's uh, pessimism about our current Supreme Court and its ability or inclination to do much in the privacy context. Um, indeed, as somebody who studies and teaches the Supreme Court in great detail, I probably may, I may even be more pessimistic than Mark about the, um, the, the institutional competence or willingness of this group of justices to do much about privacy. Um, most of you know, some of you may not, if you're, if you're not lawyers or, or versed in the American constitutional tradition, um, one huge limitation on uh, American constitutional law is called the state action doctrine, which says that the court can rein in practices by government actors, but absent a statute or something, it's very difficult to apply the Constitution to rein in actions by private actors. Now, as Mark said, as you all know, um, when we talk about major corporations like Google, Facebook, the major private players in the healthcare system that are the threats to privacy uh, today, um, the Supreme Court applying the clunky, old, limited tools of a constitutional law is, is not going to, even if it wanted to, is not going to be able to operationalize a, a kind of robust privacy protection regime. We need statutes, we need regulations to reach that private action. So in a sense, the Supreme Court is, is destined to be on the sideline. But even with those kind of um, deep-seated limitations, the, the particular doctrine that the Supreme Court has constructed and applied in the privacy context over the past few decades seems to me particularly anachronistic and ill-suited for this 21st century world um, that, that Mark has described. Um, when one reads the cases, and this includes the Maryland versus King case, uh, as well as cases stretching back the, over the last few years and, and then a few decades, there's a distinct and, and in my view, very anachronistic um, 
almost fetishism of physicality, physical space, physical intrusion, as, as often the touchstone of whether a privacy violation occurs or not. This is grounded in deep-rooted doctrines of trespass and the Fourth Amendment protections of the home, um, all of which were and, and are very important, but embrace only part of what we care about when we think about privacy rights. Think about health data. Um, today, does it even have a physical location? Uh, it probably has, you know, it's, it's out there in the electronic cloud. It's probably in multiple places. The notion of physical intrusion or trespass, uh, which was in this case on Monday, they said swabbing, not a big physical intrusion. Whether or not you agree with that, why should that be the test of whether this, this scheme, you know, creates privacy harms, et cetera? Um, and um, interestingly, in another area of doctrine that protects very important rights, the Supreme Court used to be, have this kind of tangi tangible physical emphasis, and it's moved away from it. And that's the protection of uh, reproductive rights, sexual freedom. Uh, the early cases, Griswold, Roe, were all about, and Griswold said things like, you can't invade the sanctity of the marital bedroom. It's situated the right to choose reproductive methods um, in, a, in, a, in a specific place. In Roe, Harry Blackman situated uh, the abortion right in a relational context, a doctor's office between the doctor and the patient. We've, we've now, the court has moved away from that in recent decades, and I think rightfully so. So when you read cases about reproductive freedom and sexual autonomy today, they've dispensed with the privacy language, they've talked about autonomy and liberty, and more importantly, and even explicitly, they've dispensed with this uh, linking the right to a specific time and place, and therefore makes the right more robust. So for instance, in Lawrence versus Texas, which affirmed the right to, um, to, to have sexual relations with somebody of the same sex, Justice Kennedy, um, in a very different sense, said, than, he, than writing on Monday, said, uh, I'm quoting now, freedom extends beyond spatial bounds, and this instant case involves liberty of the person both in its spatial and more transcendent dimensions, okay? So my problem with the court's uh, privacy jurisprudence is it hasn't made that move. It still has this very spatial, physical connection, which doesn't match up with the way data moves and is shared and can potentially cause harm in the 21st century. So this is just a, a kind of doctrinal, um, my doctrinal kind of amplification and extension of Mark's point that we just can't and shouldn't expect too much about the court, I think. Um, finally, this current court um, is if we broaden the discussion beyond privacy to think about the way this court treats information flow and information restriction, uh, we have a court that's tilted very much away from keeping information regulated or private and very much in favor of kind of uh, ultra aggressive First Amendment doctrines, particularly in the corporate speech and corporate regulation context, to open up the flow of information in some ways, per sometimes pernicious ways. Um, Mark mentioned the INS versus Sorrell, the Vermont case where privacy on the one hand was pitted against kind of newfound solicitude by the court for like ultra corporate free speech for data miners, not even speech, I guess, acquisition of data. And they sided as they have in many cases with the corporate free speech claim. So we can't expect this group to be very solicitous of, of um, privacy. So that's, I, I'm, I'm just in a sense, that's a long winded way of saying, I absolutely agree with Mark. We won't expect much from the court, but just like other areas of our constitutional and public policy firmament, that's probably okay. We, we, there's plenty of other institutions. Mark has outlined the plan. I would add to that, I think beyond legislation, um, certainly in the health privacy context, the existing agencies that mediate health privacy rules, HHS with HIPAA most, most obviously, some of the new uh, implementing agencies for the Affordable Care Act are gonna become important nodes of, of, of policy making and, and, um, and privacy protection. And then finally, I would just note to, to supplement what Mark said, the crucial role that private actors are gonna play in this regime, can and do play in this regime, not always as pure villains from a privacy perspective, but thinking about the big healthcare health systems that exist today and will grow and become even more integrated through the Affordable Care Act, thinking about institutions like the university where I work with the prodigious research it does and the institutional review boards. Um, there's no way um, the government is gonna be able to do all this. Private entities have to be kind of integrated into it and, and be nuanced as well. So it's, um, um, so I think Mark's essential point that multiple institutions matter and the Supreme Court can't do it all is, is, 
is clearly the case. Um, so that's all I, so s s we want to, uh, I, Mark, I don't know if you want to say more, or I think we no. both want to bring you in, bring the audience in. Sure, well, I mean, I just want to say I appreciate your comments, Ted. I'm not, um, to be clear, completely pessimistic. Uh, I am of the view that when the court hears a case, I think we have a reasonable chance of believing that we can prevail. And I'm also of the view that privacy is a um, nonpartisan issue where traditional alignments, you know, can change easily. Uh, many of the important decisions this term were decided on a five to four basis, which I think is one more indicator of how close uh, we are. So um, I don't want to appear overly optimistic about this, um, but I think it's important in any uh, privacy uh, case, legislative effort campaign we pursue, uh, we do so with the belief that we have a reasonable opportunity to win. It's always, that's always been my view. Perhaps this is childlike and simple, but as a, just a regular old citizen, I kind of think, don't I have a Fourth Amendment right against search and seizure, and they can't take my medical records without my consent, and the state can't force my insurance company to send my medical records into a database that they can then either look at or release in some uh, fashion. So could, do we have any legal basis to challenge this, or are you really saying we don't have a constitutional right to challenge the health care laws, basically, and, and the removal of our right of consent. Yeah, I mean, I, I, great question. You know, two brief points. One, obviously, HIPAA does come into play with certain types of records in certain settings, and I know people in this room are, are more expert on that topic uh, than I am, but it is a reflection of how a uh, policy interest, like the protection of medical records, are transformed through legislation, or in this instance, through regulation into an outcome that provides some uh, protection. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the adequacy of the protection, uh, but that was certainly one of the key aims of HIPAA. Uh, to Ted's point about how the court views um, non-physical intrusion into privacy, I'll say that this is an area that I'm particularly interested in because of the modern doctrine of informational privacy. It's actually what I teach. Uh, the law of information privacy, which is, you know, something that Justice Scalia has pushed back against uh, very aggressively. On the other hand, within the European institutions, informational privacy just became, within the context of the Lisbon Treaty and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, a constitutional right for Europeans. In addition to the traditional notions of privacy. So these are Articles 7 and 8 of the Lisbon Treaty. If you could imagine, you know, a U.S. Constitution with, with an Article 40, with, an, with a Fourth Amendment, and where are we, 28, 29th? I mean, tack an amendment on the end that says you have a right to informational privacy. That's basically the structure now of the European uh, Constitution. So, I don't know if you um, I'm not an attorney, but I downloaded a paper from University of Arizona from legal scholars um, that has been published recently asking the question, is data speech? And in regards to that question, um, how would this all play out um, in terms of who owns the data and um, what might we need to do as this digital age continues to move forward in, in regards to our protections? Yeah, that, that's another great question. You know, over the years, I've been involved in lots and lots of different privacy cases. One of my favorite involved a privacy advocate from Virginia who was very concerned about the lack of adequate safeguards in the Virginia state record system. And so she obtained the social security numbers of high-level Virginia officials and published the social security numbers to make the political point that there was not sufficient privacy protection. And people said, well, how do you feel about that? Isn't that a violation of people's uh, privacy? And my, my answer was, well, here's an area where the First Amendment interest is really at its high point. It's pure political expression. And that's the reason that the information is being published. And we sided with her as against the state of Virginia, which was trying to prevent her from doing that. 
I make that point because at the opposite end of the spectrum, I think is the commercial use of a person's personal data for someone else's benefit, oftentimes without their meaningful consent. Now, the entities that do this will argue that they have a First Amendment right, but that First Amendment right to me looks very different from the First Amendment claim of the privacy activist who's saying we have a problem with the security of state data systems. I don't know. If well, I, I agree with that, but and certainly, however, under current law, and I think we would agree this is an unfortunate under the Sorrell case, the um, the court, the majority of the court, kind of ob obscured the conceptual distinction between pure political use of data and commercial use of data, and folded the the prescribing data into a free speech claim. So I don't know if they would have said the data is speech, but because the data furthered communicative speech, albeit in a very corporate commercial context, they were willing to wrap it up in the First Amendment. Um. Uh, Adrian Gropper. Uh, your uh, review of recent uh, Supreme Court cases that you began your, your talk with uh, was uh, interesting because it seems to me it fell into two different categories of cases that hasn't been so visible before. One of them had to do with attributes or harms related to privacy uh, issues, and the other one had to do with identity mm -hmm. of the individual, maybe for the first time. I'm not a student of, of these things. Uh, is uh, the, uh, the issue of identity, and in particular identity in cyberspace, as, as we have, uh, really something new under the law? Is it uh, something that is more, uh, that should be treated as a separate category? before we can talk about consent and, and other issues that we all talk about, do we have uh, a need to look at identity uh, in this uh, constitutional or, or legal right. sense to separate it out as a, as a framework for going forward? You know, it's actually a great question. I've always been fascinated uh, by the topic of anonymity, which I see as the overlap in the speech realm between you know, privacy protecting disclosure of your identity and, and freedom of expression. And there are a long line of Supreme Court cases which essentially established that there is a right of anonymity in the First Amendment that a state, for example, can't require you to put your name on a pamphlet uh, prior to publication. You know, you want to circulate some protest about a city bond issue or something like that. That was the McIntyre case from 95. You know, the Supreme Court looked at the founding of the country and the Federalist Papers said people had unpopular views. They wrote under pseudonyms. And part of our constitutional tradition is the right to be able to engage in expressive acts without being required to say who you are. And we followed this line of cases. In fact, I wrote briefs in a number of them. Uh, one case uh, had to do with election practices in the state of Colorado, whether a person circulating a petition could be required to wear a name badge. The state of Colorado thought that was necessary to reduce fraud. The Supreme Court, in opinion by Justice Ginsburg, said no. Actually, that's a political act. Uh, another case called Watchtower Bible. People are going door to door soliciting for their cause. I said to someone, we're going to do an amicus in that case. And someone said, oh, that's great. Those people are so annoying. You really have to protect the privacy of homeowners. And I said, well, that's very 20th century thinking. What we have to do is to protect the privacy of the identity of the people who are trying to express their views. And that case also you know, turned out favorably. But then we got to an interesting opinion. I'm sorry if I'm going on a bit about this, but I'm really fascinated, and I hope you are too, because this is the material of which the court you know, reaches its decisions. And it has to do, in fact, with a decision this week, Maryland versus King, which uh, uh, Justice Kennedy wrote. Well, Justice Kennedy wrote also our first bad um, identity opinion, at least from our perspective, which was a 2005 case called Heibel versus Sixth Judicial District. And this had to do with uh, state laws that allow the arrest of a person, not on probable cause, but on suspicious behavior and a failure to provide an identification document. A number of states you know, have these laws that say, in essence, um, if you're engaging in suspicious behavior, but not enough to arrest, 
and the officer asks you for identification and you fail to provide it, that provides the basis uh, for the arrest. And, um, you know, we, we had challenged that fourth and fifth. And when I say we challenge, by the way, these are not cases that Epic brings, but we do write these very detailed amicus briefs, and our advisory board and Dr. Peel and others participate in those briefs, so I, I hope they have some impact. Uh, but Justice Kennedy, in that case, ruling for five to four court, upheld the state's authority to arrest under these statutes. And he cited the Heibel decision in Maryland versus King this week, seeing the collection of DNA as a permissible type of identification uh, that, that the court would uphold. So, um, uh, you know, it's not at a good moment with respect to your right to protect against the disclosure of your identity, but there is, just in the last 30 or 40 years, and the famous case, by the way, is NAACP versus Alabama, 1958 case about the disclosure of the membership records of the NAACP. The court has clearly recognized um, significant constitutional interest in a person's ability to withhold the disclosure of their identity. The question is what are the circumstances where it will be applied? So. Um, just quickly, I would, I, I think it's a very useful distinction to, to make between anonymity and privacy as kind of cognate overlapping concepts, but somewhat distinct. And it's particularly, uh, it's also important in the health privacy context uh, when we think about the use of health data in, in research and comparative effectiveness studies, et cetera. Um, there's one objection to that or concern, set of concerns about that that's grounded in a kind of privacy rights, almost a misappropriation of the data without consent. There's a separate set of objections about anonymity concerns. You know, so some people will, would be satisfied with aggregation of data with sufficient anonymity ag ag algorithms in place. Others wouldn't, but in, and in a sense, so concerns about health data privacy sometimes are rooted in different conceptual starting points, and that might lead to different reactions to certain arrangements. I wanted to follow up on Adrian's comment. Uh, is that better? I, I own a little spot in cyberspace. It's 1.3.6.1.1. 1.3.6.1 uh, is the internet, and 1.3.6.1.1 is uh, the directory structure for the internet. So in, within my own space that, that it's been registered and it, it's out there, uh, we define a, a virtual image of, of the United States in cyberspace. So the physicality argument was very interesting to me about the bumper and the GPS tracking unit because uh, to most people I would say that cyberspace is now a reality. It's not just some obscure concept. People live on Facebook. People live in Google Plus. I do, mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, every day and they interact with it. So everything having to do with that. And I, just in terms of the question part of this, um, I felt the easiest thing was to do in terms of, the, of attacks. And so what I did is I simply pulled in and defined a specific unique ID for, uh, that's based on the Geneva Conventions, of which we are a signatory. And, you know, I saw ambulances going through in the, ma I mean, in, in, in the World War II movies, Hogan's Heroes or, what, you know, all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about. But you see the, you see the uh, uh, Red Cross crossing over borders and maintaining, you know, privacy in, in that structure. So aren't we bound by the Geneva Convention to not attack medical data? I have to say that that's the first time I've been asked that question. <laughs> and, and I've spoken at a lot of privacy conferences. Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer, actually. Um, but I will say I think part of what your question speaks to is that increasingly in this interconnected global world, we're confronting privacy issues that exist outside the bounds of traditional legal jurisdictions. I mean, we can talk about the right to privacy in the United States, but we also think about the right to privacy in the European Union or in Latin America or East Asia or any region of the world in which data is um, collected. And so uh, much of my work, particularly over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, has been trying to understand what these global norms uh, look like uh, for privacy protection. And I tend to uh, reject the view that privacy is culturally determined. I think you'll certainly find evidence and, and the anthropologists can tell you a lot about how in particularly, particular localized settings, 
you know, some people uh, establish certain uh, physical distance in communication, and other people establish different physical distance in communication. But the reality of the internet in our global society is that we are increasingly integrated into common environments for the collection and use of personal data. And trying to understand the privacy standards for those common environments, the ones that we share as data moves around the world, I think is the great challenge. Now, the notion of fair information practices has always been a useful way to structure it. And as I've looked at the evolution of law, I think the Europeans have carried the concept the furthest to date. But it's actually originally a US conception. It's how we talked about privacy protection when the automation of personal records first began in the US in the 60s and 70s was the framework for our Privacy Act of 1974. So I see that not only as the basis of a global uh, standard for data, but also very much um, American standard. I don't have any more constitutional questions for two constitutional scholars. <laughs> these are these are these are your chances. These are uh, great experts. Wonderful answers. Uh, might be sort of an off the wall question here, but I'm just curious to get your take on it. We, we talk about data or electronic data in particular as if it is not physical, but it is. I mean, it has real physicality. It has measurable properties. It's empirical. You know, has an, an, an empirically constructed. You know, whether it's, it's stored on, on the, being transmitted over wire, or stored on a CD, or on a hard drive, it has real physical properties. So just out of curiosity, how come it's not treated as if it's physical property? If it's my data and it has physicality, how come it's not typically viewed as being my data, my physical data, the same way my wallet would be, you know, have data in it that's mine? So I'm just curious your response to that. Well, you know, it's a good point. I mean, I think your question also sort of, and, and Ted may agree with this, kind of points to the difficulty that the court's current doctrine has uh, with intangible items. I mean, uh, this is not something, you know, Justice Scalia may have spent quite a bit of time in the 18th century, but I don't think he encountered any <laughs> computer servers, right? And it was really not until uh, Justice Brandeis, I'm going to get into trouble for that comment, I can tell. <laughs> we love you, Justice Scalia, we really do. But, um, but it was really not till the end of the 19th century, you know, that, that then uh, Boston lawyer Louis Brandeis uh, talked about the right of privacy as to the intangibles, as to information about people. Uh, as something apart, you know, from the, from the f physicality of, of those things that might otherwise be protected in law. And he was quite explicitly in that famous Right to Privacy article making the claim for how the law needed to evolve to protect the intangible interests associated with personhood. Um, but the court is still, you know, split on this. Um, and, and I think uh, until we get some convergence, as I said, I thought there was convergence in, in Justice Kagan's remarkable opinion, Jardines, but it didn't seem to take us far enough. So, just a quick uh, aside about the kind of physicality of data and the way the law interacts with the, this. Um, I worked briefly during law school in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston as a you know, part-time worker and, and intern, and uh, there was a, um, a prosecution against public prosecution against a, an IRS worker who had been fishing around in records and in violating people's. Uh, no, no Tea Party involved, but the, um, um, <laughs> but to, the predicate in the indictment for a, uh, a wire fraud was interstate wire fraud, and he's sitting at his office in Boston. Well, the server, it turns out, was up in New Hampshire, so the indictment spelled out how the like, you know, the data, you know, the request went up, across the state line on some wire, and came back, which to me is far too literal for the 21st century. But this was, you know. This was. This is still part of our law that the, that even even electronic data we kind of track it physically, in ways. I mean, as Mark was talking about with the cloud servers, I, I think, I think that's becoming a kind of rusty, anachronistic way to think about data, but it's still very much with us. Okay, I've got to ask you all. So, this is the first time we've had constitutional scholars here. Do you think this this is this is great enough to bring them back every year and ask more about health? <laughs>
health of the Constitution. I, yeah, you don't get to hear this at hymns. So uh, you can anyway, ask again also, after we leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, also, I, no. I, I, this was a fascinating discussion. We are very, very glad you both came to to help us with this.